This original WSRE presentation is made possible by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome everyone to this edition of Pensacola State College Perspectives. I'm your host, Patrice Witten, and with us today are some very special guests. Vivian Spencer, Gallery Director of the Switzer Center for Visual Arts, is with us, and the 2012 Anna Lamar Switzer Distinguished Artist, Jean Quick to See Smith. Both of these ladies are here, and we're going to have a conversation about art today. Vivian, to begin, tell us about the endowment and the wonderfully generous gift that started the Anne Lamar Switzer Distinguished Artist Series. Well, thank you, Patrice. It's a real honor to be here today with Jean Quick to see Smith. As you said, she's our 2012 Distinguished Artist. And the Distinguished Artist Series began in 2002 with a generous gift by the Switzer Riley family. And the Distinguished Artist Series is just a portion of that endowment. So what we do annually is to invite artists of distinction, such as Jean, here to the Pensacola campus during her exhibition so that she can interact with our students, members of the community, and provide an enrichment, which is part of the endowment's underwriting. And this generous endowment has brought many big name artists to our area and uh, Jean is one of the many who have excelled in their work and have brought us the wonderful gift of art. And um, Jean, tell us, you were born on a reservation in Montana and how, in your early life, how did you come by your name? Uh, thank you, Patrice. I'm, I'm happy to be here today. I'm honored uh, to be here uh, with the college and I thank Vivian and the college for this, uh, for, for this lovely honor. Um, yes, I was born at the Salish Kootenai, Confederated Salish Kootenai. There are five tribes that are confederated. Most people think of one tribe and, you know, like Cherokee, uh, but uh, sometimes the government put several tribes together. So we have four Salish speaking tribes and uh, the Kootenais are Algonquian speakers. And um, I was born at the Catholic Mission there. Uh, on, on my reservation. My father uh, was a horse trader and um, uh, sometimes an itinerant worker, depending on uh, what our circumstances were. And when I was two, my mother left my little sister and I um, at a neighbor's and, uh, and uh, she left with the fruit crop workers. She too uh, was illiterate. And um, so my father kept us, and then sometimes we were in welfare homes and sometimes we were with him. So I, needless to say, my early life was not the typical, um, what we think of as the typical Dick and Jane American life. And um, with those beginnings, uh, people don't expect you to um, be doing what I'm doing today. How, how did you know, when did you know you were going to become an artist? I knew very early on. When I was um, six and I started first grade, um, you know, that's where I first met crayons and uh, library paste and tempera paint. And most Indian children will smell things first and then eat them and or taste them. And I did. And crayons were really crumbly. Um, <laughs> and the tempera paint was kind of gritty and not very tasteful. Uh, and the library paste actually was quite tasty. <laughs> um, so not knowing the word artist, that's my first experience with m making, uh, you know, drawing and painting. And uh, I just knew that that was something that uh, was, was gave me great pleasure. It was a place that I wanted to be, not knowing what that was. And when I was 13, um, I started work when I was eight uh, as a field hand for the Nisei farmers who came back from the internment camps. And when I was 13, 
uh, a group of us rode in the back of a pickup truck into uh, town to see a Saturday matinee and I saw Toulouse Lautrec and I was so overwhelmed by his life uh, and what he was able to do that when I came back home I got the neighbor man who lived down the road who had a camera to take my picture and I got down on my knees and I put my dad's axle grease on my chin and um, put a crushed a hat, put it on my head and had him take my picture so that I could become that thing so that it was a way of me transforming myself, taking myself out of my world and becoming becoming that thing I wanted to be so badly. So that was just the beginning of my, I think, my becoming. I still feel like that today. I'm still still becoming that thing that I want to be when I grow up. And your name came to you? That's from uh, my grandmother. Her mother was a strong old woman. and. Um, you know, on my reservation, on the northern reservations, uh, we have names like that that came from our languages because remember, Lewis and Clark didn't come across the Mississippi until 200 years ago. So, uh, you know, white people didn't come to my reservation until about 100 years ago. So, at the time that my father was born. So, you have to realize that those tribes were in really isolated areas and our names were traditional names. So like Alice Stands in Timmer and John Shoot Straight and Quick to See and Strong Old Woman are all traditional names. And so my father gave me that name. And um, J-A-U-N-E is yellow in French. You know, we had uh, lots of uh, French traders who came. They were the first whites who came. And uh, what they did was they purchased uh, our women for uh, slaves to carry their trap lines, you know, cook their meals, you know, to serve and wait on them. And so one of my grandmothers was purchased for $50. Actually, there's a book in Canada uh, because part of my heritage is Cree, French Cree. And there's a book in Canada, actually, that's written about my family called The $50 Pride. My goodness. You're referred to as a cultural art worker. Could you expound on what that means? Well, you know, growing up uh, and going to public school, you know, we learned very little about Native Americans in this country. People know very little. Many people think that Natives are still not alive. Or if we don't look like Hollywood movies, they think that we're not. You know, I've had many people ask me if I'm Japanese, if I'm Asian. Um, you know, I've heard that many times. And if you tell them you're uh, a native person, uh, you know they say, "Oh, but you don't, you don't look native. Like all natives should look the same." I mean, we have 3,000 languages and uh, you know hundreds of tribes, 651 tribes uh, that are federally recognized right now, and um, several hundred more who are asking for recognition. Every everyone, every tribe is different. Every tribe has a different language, different culture. Uh, and so, you know, you can't, um, uh, you, you, you can't live as with your own identity and struggle with that all the time. So part of my work uh, is, uh, you know, meeting with African American people and Asian people. Uh, and we all talk about these struggles that we have, Latinos. You know, mm -hmm. we, we mm -hmm. all have these same struggles in society. And our histories are not really written into public school education. So I wear many hats. Um, and one is to have the opportunity to come out like this and speak about my heritage um, and, uh, you know, give some factual information and always hope that I leave some enlightened people after I leave. So I think as a cultural arts worker, I not only make my work, but I also teach. Uh, I also uh, jury art exhibitions. I speak at museums. I organize exhibitions. I've organized over 30 exhibitions for contemporary Native artists. Um, uh, you know, uh, I advise museums on contemporary Native art. Um, I do public art. I, I design the uh, the main floor in the Denver airport and recently designed another section, um, a seating area in the Yerba Buena Park in San Francisco. I have many large public art um, pieces around the country. Interesting. 
Yes, your your work is um, in several prestigious collections uh, through the U throughout the U.S. and Europe, and um, you know it's one of those things that when society interacts with art, there's something very important, and lives are changed and almost inspirational. One would say, talk about how our society interacts with art from your perspective as an artist. You know. Um you know, I, I think back, uh, you know, to uh, when I first uh, started college and uh, learning about art. And in those days, it was uh, mostly about white men who made art, like Jackson Pollock and de Kooning. Those were the, so there were no role models for women, and mm -hmm. certainly not for Native women. Um, and I think that um, this country has a, um, has an idea that artists don't pull their weight, they don't work, they're lazy people, uh, that, um, uh, that we really aren't part of working class people. And uh, what they don't realize is that, and Vivian knows this very well, is that artists are often called upon to uh, fundraise for hospitals, for local libraries, for all sorts of things, for universities. Whenever someone is in need of fundraising or money, they think about uh, their local artists, and mm -hmm. and uh, we're asked to donate our work. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I'm asked on a regular basis to do this. Mm -hmm. we, we very much are part of working class America, and often we are teachers. I'm an itinerant or traveling teacher, but, right. you know, um, so I come out and meet with students at colleges and universities, mm -hmm. um, you know, to share news about my art and my work and uh, things that I really care about in society, which are education, more, more education, more enlightened education uh, about our people of color in this country, um, uh, more enlightened education about women, women's roles, uh, Native Americans, uh, you know, making some corrections to history about that or uh, uh, about my own history. And uh, so I think that we, we actually do a lot of extra work. We are very hard working as a group of people and usually communities know very little about us. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think you're correct. The, uh, but we're very fortunate here on our college campus to foster that environment uh, where the artist is appreciated and nurtured and educated to be a productive person in society one that has the skills and the articulation to be able to represent themselves uh, as an artist. And that's one thing we strive to do you know, within the art department and with our different uh, internships in the community. I think movies have spoiled mm -hmm. the image of an artist. The idea that an artist lives in an attic and has an inspiration in the middle of the night, drinks some whiskey, and you know, <laughs> and throw some paint at the canvas. I think, mm -hmm. you know, maybe that's kind of like Hollywood or something. Mm -hmm. And it's just not reality. Well, currently your work is on display at the Switzer Center for Visual Arts. And I understand there were nine paintings created in two, uh, last year, 2011, for this exhibit. Could you talk about that experience and how that came to be? Well, you know, when Vivian first asked me, uh, you know, I was uh, in the middle of, of uh, getting a house renovation and I had other things going on. And so I was already working on some paintings and, um, you know, they weren't coming together just right. I do a lot of research. I pick a subject and then I look for information. I read a lot of books. I Google things. You know, sometimes I have to go, go visit whatever it is. In this case, this this began uh, with the idea about drought because we get eight inches of water a year. That's our standard, and we were we only had three inches of water, and so I, I'm on a well. So our water is um, is dropping because we have a new factory on a mesa above us that is taking a lot of our groundwater. So water is a major issue, especially being in the desert. But you know, uh, learning about the aquifers in the Midwest and the water dropping there, Albuquerque had thought that it had a huge uh, underground lake 
and then lately the scientists have been going, oops, it's not there like we thought. It It's much lower than we thought it was, and yes, it is waning. So, you know, you hear these stories all over the country, and then, of course, you hear about potable water uh, in the Middle East or lack of potable water, and in Africa as well. And they say that there will be more wars fought over water than oil. So water is a really important subject, and I began doing more research on that. And then near my house, um, there's, a, there's an old Indian site that was dug up in the 1930s, and in the ground is uh, a kiva, which is a church. It's a place of worship. And it's a large uh, circular room, probably about the size of this room that we're in. And there were murals on the walls, 84 murals that were stripped off in the 30s. One of the murals is kept intact in a little museum right on the grounds. And I've gone there for years and taken people there. Mm -hmm. But this time when I went there, it became really apparent to me. This was like really talking to me, the images in the murals. And I'm thinking, you know, here they were a thousand years ago uh, talking about water. Water was coming out of the eagle's beak, off the hands of the human. You know, there, were, there was a river, uh, there was a catfish uh, that was partly man and partly, partly human and partly catfish. And water was everywhere. And I said, these people were dealing with water issues here in the desert a thousand years ago. And here yes, we indeed. are. We're doing the same thing right now. So um, I kept going out and visiting that. And as I did that, these paintings grew to what they are right now. Mm -hmm. Every, almost every, well, two-thirds of the paintings in the exhibit are about water. I have one-third that's about war, because that, that's been an issue on my mind as well. Mm -hmm. Vivian, there are many um, uh, programs and some activities planned around this prestigious ex exhibit. Mm -hmm. Could you talk about some of those activities? And well, uh, what I try to do in association with the visiting artists is that there's always educational components for our students. And we have educational components for the community. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, as John said, yesterday there were two public uh, talks in the gallery. And then there was a classroom visit, a printmaking demonstration. And so today we're heading out to our local Indian community out to their heritage center. Our Muscogee Creek Indians have 1,200 acres that has been given to them by the county commissioners and they have made it into nature trails, bird sanctuary, and a museum. Mm -hmm. And yesterday as well, they had their mobile museum on campus for the campus community to visit and learn about their heritage. And then uh, tomorrow there is another printmaking workshop and demonstration at 10 a.m., which is open to the public. And we encourage people to come out and visit the Switzer Center Gallery and learn more about our programming and the classes we offer mm -hmm. and to see the exhibit, which is up through March 9th. That's wonderful to know, and it's wonderful that we have an opportunity for our publics to interact with the artist, mm -hmm. and our students in particular have uh, find this very beneficial and uh, an opportunity to meet you, John, and other artists like you. You know, from your perspective, wh what impacts your work the most, uh, especially as, as it pertains to your traditional beliefs? Well, you know, uh, social issues impact all, all my work. I mean, there are, there are, you know, symbolism and symbols and from uh, pop society, you know, consumer society mixed together with, um, you know, some traditional symbols like the four directions or which is to remind people about our environment. Um, and so, but, but I think it's all seen through uh, the vision or you know, through the ideology of a native point of view, because, uh, you know, I've studied our traditional religion, you know, I've gone to ceremonies for years and years at home, and um, they're really meaningful to me, um, because they're, I think, closer to Buddhism than they are to Christianity, but um, they really are about being part of the net of life, that we are only a knot in that net net of life. In fact, I have a piece that's entitled 
that, that the Smithsonian had commissioned to send to overseas embassies. And, um, and I did that piece with that perspective because other tribal societies have the same belief mm -hmm. that Buddhism and that we Native people have. Mm-hmm. Well, that's um, interesting to know that from your perspective as an artist, you're looking at it through a different lens, perhaps, that you share with those who are the observers, who are the participants on the other side of the canvas. Um, what is your routine? Do you have a routine as an artist? Do you wake up every morning and say at this particular time, or does it come to you? Um, just talk about that a little bit more. No, you know, if you're a working artist today and uh, you're doing all the things that I'm doing, you know, which is uh, writing essays for books, doing public art, you know, coming out and teaching at universities, uh, exhibiting my art, uh, in nearly 40 years, uh, you know, I do one to two solo exhibits a year. I'm blessed that I'm invited. Like, this is a real blessing to be invited here. Believe me, I am I never uh, am, you know, a diva and think that, oh, I deserve this. You have to really work hard, uh, you know, to accomplish this or to be recognized, and I'm always very honored by that. But when I'm working, when I'm at home working, I go to work every day just like you do. Uh, by 8.30 every morning I'm in the studio. And even if I'm not inspired that day or I'm tired and I'm feeling low, uh, I may clean brushes that day or sweep or, you know, uh, you know uh, do something like that. Uh, but no, you, ha you have to go to work no matter what. And um, you, you, it's not, not so much about inspiration. It's more about like steady uh, uh, working, researching, thinking, planning, you know, to make something happen. It doesn't just come like spontaneously. It, in other words, the work that I do, which has narrative stories with each piece, everything has to be thought about for over a period of time. Some of those things take me actually two years. See. These took nearly a year. My goodness. Well, your art is in many prestigious collections, has been, and you've experienced audiences from all over the world. Uh, what, what is different uh, from one part of the country for the United States, for example, specifically, uh, about participating in art, the audience's participation? What have you observed? You know, uh, because our society is such a consumer society, because it's, it's so industrialized, it's taught people that, you know, homemade things, handmade art, folk art, is not really art. And real art is what you would see in the mall in terms of, and, and we all, you know, like t-shirts and, and, you know, mm -hmm. uh, G. Clay prints. Mm -hmm. That's what you see in the stores uh, with plastic frames on them. And uh, whereas in Europe people value folk art and uh, handmade paintings, um, and uh, I think that our society uh, puts great value in consumer goods, especially sports items as well, are seen, I think, is People hang them on their walls, so it's seen as art. So I think, you know, uh, programs like this mm -hmm. help enlighten people about Indeed. about original art or, um, you know, showing people that, you know, there's another way to view art than what we think uh, art is. I mean, we don't learn in school, so... Uh, art is not valued the way it is in maybe New York, uh, people who live in New York go to the museums all the time, so they actually see original art or San Francisco. Uh, but out in the boonies, uh, like out in where I live, you know, it's not so much seen that way. I mean, Santa Fe has galleries and people come there for that. But generally across America, I think art is pr probably found in the sh shopping mall. Um. You hold four honorary degrees, which is just 
amazing and wonderful. Talk about those honors and what that means to you. Well, it, I, I mean, you know, you feel really privileged if someone calls and, and they want to bring you to their university and, um, you know, uh, place an honorary degree on you. Um, I think that um, uh, you, you have to be you have to be really humbled by that to uh, have that happen. I, I think that, you know, when I think about my friends like Faith Ringgold and Miriam Shapiro and Amalia Mesa Baines, uh, who are all scholars, who've all written, who make art, who travel this country, um, and I think Faith has 16, and so I have a long ways to go. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but, you know, uh, I think when you when you work really hard and you are recognized for your work. I think that that's that's an incredible reward. I also think sometimes that you have to live long enough and be in this field long enough for you know those kinds of things to happen. But it is it's it's a great honor. It's it's real reward and support for what you do, and it encourages. I think it encourages you, you know, to con continue your work. No doubt. And recently, you received a grant. I understand to archive your work. Uh, the Joan Mitchell Foundation mm -hmm. in New York, mm -hmm. which is a, a notable foundation in this country, um, secretly uh, uh, chose my name with three other artists, and uh, we were given a grant to archive our work. And again, I, it's a, a matter of living long enough, I think, and being seen mm -hmm. as an elder artist to um, uh, to have something like this happen. So that's a great honor. It's a big project. I mean, right now we have 3,800 pieces loaded into the computer, oh, right. and we have another 1,000 in the studio, and then I have four lockers of art that will um, that have to be inventoried, and then all the collectors out there. So it's a big yes. job. It sounds as though it's a massive work, body of work that it you've is. produced for our, for our world, and we thank you so very much for that. Um, it's been our honor and privilege to have you both here today. Uh, Vivian, thank you for being here and talking about the programs and the gallery. Jean, we thank you so very much for sharing your art and, and for bringing this exhibit and coming here to our area. And we look forward to seeing your exhibit. Thank you, Patrice. And we invite the public, of course, to come and join us and enjoy that. I um, want to thank all of you for being with us today for another edition of Pensacola State Perspectives. Mm -hmm.